afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Filip Ivanov. I'm the CEO of Asia Society Australia. And welcome to Asia Society, but also welcome to Art Gallery of New South Wales and, and this Asia Council, which are partners in our event today. For 63 years globally and 22 years in Australia, Asia Society has been promoting greater connectivity between Asia, Australia and the United States. Arts and culture is a big part of our DNA and we strongly believe in the fundamental role of arts and culture in deepening our understanding of the region, especially during these difficult times. Uh, before we begin, um, Asia Society acknowledges that many participants in today's event are dialing in from locations that have traditional owners and custodians. Today I'm speaking to you from the land of Bon Wurrung and Wurundjeri peoples of the East Kulin Nation. I acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to welcome and acknowledge any Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander or First Nations people joining our webcast today. Now, as today's discussion it will explore Indian cultural diplomacy, taking the tradition of Diwali as a focal point. While this year's Festival of Light may not be as festive as other years, Diwali is still India's most popular festival and is celebrated all around the world. In fact, Indian mythology, its art, and its, of course, its vibrant diaspora have a big part to play in India's cultural influence abroad. So today we'll look at how we define cultural heritage, how local stories and traditions compete, compete against globalization, and what role art plays in uh, a cultural diplomacy that one country as big, as diverse, and as influential such as India can use to project its image abroad. Um, before we hear from our speakers, let me quickly go through today's proceedings. We'll have about 35 minute panel discussion. Uh, we'll then move to audience Q&A. So please have your questions ready and submit them through the chat box and we'll do our best to answer them all. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce our speakers. First of all, Dr. Michael Brent is the director of the Art Gallery in New South Wales. Uh, he's also uh, uh, one of Australia's leading experts on Indian art. Uh, Melanie Eastburn is Senior Curator of Asian Art at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Uh, Ramanand Gaj is the Director of Swami Vivekananda Cultural Centre at the Consulate General of India in Sydney. Uh, Devlina Ghosh is Professor of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Technology, Sydney. And last but not least, Gauri Parimu Krishnan is the Director of DMBG Consultants. We have an all-star panel, and over to you, Michael. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Philip. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, happy Diwali, of course. Um, I'm speaking to you from, uh, from home in Sydney, but both my home and the Art Gallery of New South Wales sits on the land whose traditional custodians have been the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I want to pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. Um, I've had a long connection with the Asia Society, both in the US and Australia, so I'm delighted to be part of this program. And recognizing that um, the role of Asian art, well, it's of Asian art and, and culture in Australia, not just Indian art, um, has evolved quite significantly over the past decades. And it's a very different situation now than, say, you know, 25, 30 years ago. Um, interesting also to reflect on the difference when we talk about cultural heritage between, say, historical art forms and contemporary art forms, where now it's probably less common to show contemporary art in a national framework, like a show of Indian contemporary art, uh, where historical art does still tend to be shown within that sort of uh, national context. So there's a lot to discuss. Um, we've got a great panel here, so um, welcome panel as well. And I think given the limited time we have, I should just start off with the questions. And my first question is to Devlina, and that is how do we actually define cultural heritage and perhaps you know cultural heritage in national terms in the globalized world we live in well the common definition is generally cultural her heritage is an accumulation or um, conglomeration of all of those tangible and intang intangible characteristics that make up a society and a culture so you have built heritage 
in the Indian context, it could be temples or mosques or, or various other such constructions and the intangible heritage that, that actually surrounds them. Um, I think that in, in terms of a globalized world, uh, focusing on those intangible heritage aspects are really quite important because culture in the end is what is how we make meaning out of those tangible things what we associate with them how we interpret them how we see them in terms of temples who can enter and who cannot who can celebrate and who cannot same goes for other religious buildings such as mosques or churches mm -hmm. the point about cultural heritage is that places like india in general in general, but not always, were generally inclusive. I mean, most mm. of these festivals were celebrated by all communities. And it wasn't so much a question of belief, but it was a question of communal celebration. So mm. it was a time when you, you send biryani to your Hindu neighbors or whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. or Diwali was the time when you send sweets to your Muslim friends, you know, that it was mm. not that the Muslim friends necessarily believed what Diwali stood for. But the point was that they, and one person said to me, we just celebrate with, with you because you're happy, so we are happy. You know, yeah. it was that sort of, of idea about yeah. cultural heritage. Um, the problem is, I think, often in terms of globalization, and this has been seen a lot in diaspora, is that the diaspora often clings to an idea that, mm. that no longer exists in, mm. its, in its home. So the diaspora can often be more conservative than yeah. actually the society in its original homeland. And part of that is that there can be an exclusivity built up around these kinds of things for the diaspora to distinguish themselves in a particular way from their adopted home country, which is majority different, like Christian or yeah. you know, Muslim or whatever it is. So that exclusivity, I think, can have quite a damaging effect because culture i think really only works if it's really dynamic and it propagates itself if it's inclusive if it adapts if it takes into account the feelings and ideas and 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 affect of all of those people that make up the society and unless you're a monoculture a monoculture is just as damaging in society as monocropping is to agriculture yeah. you know if well, you don't have that multiple culture I think you're on the way to becoming extinct. Yeah, that's a very, very beautifully put. And of course, I mean, one word we often put before cultural heritage is shared cultural heritage. And that is what art museums are all about, is, is sharing cultural heritage in different places with different audiences. Um, Gary, over to you. In, in, could you perhaps illuminate a little bit more that idea of how cultural heritage works in diasporic communities, and particularly, say, with your experience in Singapore? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, with my uh, more than uh, 25 years in Singapore, I would like to say that um, cultural heritage is a very important identity marker for the communities uh, living in Singapore. And as you know, the historical fact is uh, Indians have been part of the landscape, cultural landscape, social landscape, as well as uh, contributed economically immensely to Singapore right from its inception by the British um, since 1819. And we also noticed that um, while Singapore is a multicultural uh, um, uh, city-state uh, republic, it also encourages uh, various aspects of its um, Indian community's uh, cultural heritage. So uh, while it is a diverse and cosmopolitan uh, culturally, it is also recognizing the fact that there are within Indian community many diverse groups. So in Singapore itself, Diwali is celebrated in on different days. For example, the South Indian community celebrates it on the 14th day of the um, lunar calendar of the um, uh, waning moon, uh, whereas the North Indian community celebrates it on the new moon day, so 14th and 15th. So the days are different. And also uh, for one community, uh, such as the Gujarati communities, uh, which I'm actually working uh, a book on their heritage and history in Southeast Asia and Singapore, there is also a new year which is following uh, the Diwali. So it is celebrated, uh, especially because it's a, a business community. Uh, they celebrate it uh, for Diwali as well as New Year, and it's a account books opening, closing and opening ceremony. 
And of course, it is celebrated in honor of uh, several gods. Of course, Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth, is the most important. Um, so what you uh, see in Singapore is a very open uh, approach. Um, most Indians will have an open house. Uh, and uh, many non-Indian friends are invited. Uh, again, as uh, Prof. Ghosh uh, mentioned, we also share sweets and you know food with our neighbors. And if you're looking at um, neighbors and friends and relatives, uh, and if you're looking at uh, evolution from say uh, post to World War to now, uh, there was a more communal uh, approach and experience uh, that people had, especially when I speak to some of my focus groups uh, in preparing for the Indian Heritage Center, that um, there's this community of uh, traders. They would move from Market Street, which is originally along the Singapore River, where most of the South Indian and Gujarati um, businesses were established, and people would move uh, celebrating Diwali from uh, within their um, um, merchant community, move from there to the uh, high street, which is where the Sindhi merchants had their shops and their businesses, and then move to Serangoon Road, where there's another cluster of um, merchants who are established and they celebrated Diwali. So um, Diwali, Dipavali, whichever uh, term uh, we use, uh, it was a very uh, open uh, celebration and even non-Hindus, uh, Indians uh, participated in this uh, festival. And, and that spirit still continues. Yeah, no, thanks, Gary. It, it is wonderful to see how Singapore continues to foster a, a sort of a, a community spirit of sharing across the different communities. In, in that's one of the most genuine ways anywhere. Uh, so, so thank you for, um, for that uh, insight into Singapore. Um, Melanie, uh, my, my colleague at the Archaeology of New South Wales, you work as a curator. So I'm just wondering, you know, you're surrounded by objects of cultural heritage, and I wonder how you see that reflect, no, see these ideas reflected nice. in your work from the historical to the contemporary and, and, and do you regard contemporary art as part of cultural heritage or is that too, too early to decide? Uh, thank you, Michael. And it's a very broad question. And I suppose I'll talk primarily from my experience of working as a curator in Australia with um, Indian collections, primarily painting, but a little bit also sculpture. Um, and it's been a real pleasure to work with those collections. And in fact, my first introduction to Indian art on any scale was um, an exhibition that, Michael, that you did in um, the 1996 of Vision of Kings at the National Gallery, which had loans from all over the world. And it was my first sort of sense of the complexity and diversity of Indian art and the great, incredible long history of that. So that was sort of an introduction and then I moved into working more with painting. But I've also had the great pleasure of doing some archival research in India and there's an artist I'd like to talk about, Desmond Lazaro, and I actually met him when I was doing some research in Puducherry where he was living. And um, I think he really beautifully encapsulates what we're discussing. He, a couple of years ago, Desmond and his family moved to Victoria from India and the gallery commissioned him to do a painting. And he has a heritage where he has a, a Burmese Indian family who migrated to England and he grew up there. And then as a young man decided he wanted to move to India and learn traditional miniature and pitchway painting techniques, which he did for many years. And so the painting we commissioned from Desmond Lazaro, which is called The Sea of Untold Stories 2, uh, really tells the story not only of the diaspora of Desmond's own family and experiences of migration um, and Indian culture through many different parts of the world, but also uses this traditional Pichuai and miniature painting techniques to tell a contemporary story of the tragedy of lives lost as people cross the Mediterranean in search of asylum. So I think that this thing, you know, it's a very continuing culture and the change in continuity uh, is so vital to what we're talking about. And it's very uh, almost impossible to separate the historical and contemporary, even when the, the stories are not always related to historical stories, but that the um, techniques and ways of communication might be there. Thanks, Millie. Um, and now to our, our cultural diplomat, uh, Ramanand. Um, just wondering if you could give us a, share a few thoughts about 
how you perceive Indian culture has been received internationally and emulated and how how has it been promoted? I think maybe it might be interesting to to, to focus a little bit on, on the festival, festivals of India. I, I think perhaps the first one was in the UK in about 1982. Certainly there was a major one in the United States in 1985 and, and that idea has continued in Europe and Asia and other places. So I'd love, love to hear what you think about that. Thank you, Michael. Um, yes, uh, as everybody is aware that Indian culture has evolved from the, the evolution of thousands of years and it has its own uh, character in terms of diversity, uh, uh, which has attracted many. And I would say uh, that diversity is a, a point of attraction uh, for the world. Because at one uh, country, you have huge amount of diversity integrated uh, and uh, living in harmony. In that, uh, I feel uh, when it comes to this evolution uh, of culture from thousands of years, it is warmly received, as you've mentioned, some of the incidences from UK, uh, the United States also, uh, it, I, almost in Europe or in Southern Hemisphere, in Africa or in Australia. It is celebrated and the culture has been received very warmly, be it uh, the various dance form, the sculptures, or even, I would say, these argan pots I received uh, yesterday and I uh, procured it in here. Uh, so argan pots, also the delicate material, if I could get it in Australia now, this also shows the transcending uh, popularity of uh, Indian culture across uh, continents and it's growing day by day uh, and uh, there are cultural, uh, the, as I mentioned, the diversity itself is a point of attraction uh, in terms of uh, language, uh, dance, classical dance, uh, folk dance, or even in terms of culinary. Uh, which itself open a Pandora box as it's a festive season going on. So it is incomplete without uh, culinary. So these uh, kind of diversity has uh, attracted people from across the world. And that becomes, uh, and that also not only attracted, but also has encouraged people to know more about India. And that has brought in various tourists to uh, incredible India in terms of uh, uh, studying, uh, Ajanta, Elora Caves, or various uh, destinations which has of uh, heritage significance and thousands of years they are uh, standing tall. And uh, we are fortunate that Michael, the scholar of Indian culture, is uh, presiding over this. He has also himself have studied uh, various uh, heritage sites in India. And uh, it's a matter of pride for me to uh, contribute with other fellow panelists to be the part of this. When it comes to the emulation of Indian culture, uh, the diversity as of Indian culture has been uh, received or reciprocated in a very, uh, uh, I would say not in a unanimous manner. As uh, diaspora progressed agro across the world, they became the cult uh, cultural ambassador of India in uh, constructive contribution by constructively contributing it to their respective uh, country of uh, residence. So slowly that uh, amalgamation has uh, started and uh, when it comes to the various elements uh, like the celebration of Diwali, now you'll find uh, lots of uh, festivities are also happening across the world. Uh, even the White House also celebrates uh, the uh, Diwali festival. Yesterday, uh, Honorable Prime Minister of Australia also delivered a message in terms of uh, uh, for the Diwali occasion. That's also uh, reflects uh, the uh, growing importance of festivities and when it comes to the uh, present time of challenging time of COVID-19 I feel uh, the uh, festivities is uh, the occasion which not only uh, rejuvenates you but also helps us uh, to unite and uh, reduce your stress levels so that way it is uh, beneficial to all. Yeah so thanks thanks Ramanand. Um, you just mentioned you know, the, the actual celebration of Diwali. And so, Divlan, I'd like to ask you a question about, you know, as Diwali is celebrated really right around the world now, um, you know, how, how through that has Indian culture, say, been sometimes localized and even appropriated as part of that global celebration? Sorry, could you just repeat? I couldn't uh, uh, get yours. 
Oh, sorry. So a question to Devlana about Dev, Devlina, sorry, about the, the actual celebration of, of uh, Diwali mm -hmm. and how Indian culture through that might have been localized or appropriated even when it when it's celebrated globally. So I think um, for diasporic um, communities, um, there are always aspects of the culture which are easier to to um, to celebrate or to 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 make real to them and uh, for example i mean i think in diwali the the lamps are the ways in which you make it familiar to or you make it um uh, you know accessible to those who are not familiar with the stories themselves because i think as mr garge pointed out that uh, and also of course uh, magari is that there are so many different reasons to celebrate Diwali. So not only the reasons that she pointed out, like where I come from in Bengal, we don't celebrate Diwali so much as what we call Kali Puja, which is a, a festival of the goddess Kali of death and destruction. And of course we have um, fireworks and we do have lamps and so on, but our major sort of focus at Diwali time, this is a similar date, the lunar calendar is really the festival of Kali. So, um, so Diwali as such has different meanings and interpretations. And I think for diasporic communities, I mean, there are certain characteristics that they hang on to, like the idea of the festival of lights and sparklers and all of those sorts of things, but um, and the exchange of presents and sweets and so on. Um, but uh, the thing to also remember, I think, I suppose, what is interesting is uh, if you have an example for uh, just an, as an example, the secularization of Christmas, which a whole range of people now sort of celebrate Christmas, including me. I'm not a Christian, but, you know, I have a tree and I, you know, have presents and, you know, my, my daughter loves it. My grandchildren love it. It's not that we go to church or there's no association with Christian religion. It's actually a festival about community. This is one of the big differences, I think, at least for me in secular, say, secular Australia and India is in India, we had festivals every month. There was a festival and the festival was about community. And one of the, the advantages of being a Hindu is that you don't actually have to, um, you know, read a particular book or go to a particular holy site. You, you, you can be a Hindu by just participating without believing. And I think one of our scholars said it's about practice rather than belief. So the practice of actually lighting the candles, having the sweets, lighting the lamps or doing all of those things, that is what keeps it alive. And I would say for a lot of younger people, the second generation of the diaspora may not quite understand what this represents. I mean, in terms of the victory of good over evil, the light over darkness, all of those sim symbolic sort of representations, but they understand that it's a community festival where you get together with people. And I just want to also make this point because it's important that not all people in, not all communities in India actually see Diwali is a time of celebration and the Dalits are one of the major people who reject Diwali because it's seen as a victory over the god Ravan whom they claim as one of their own. So therefore for them it's not a not a point of celebration. So again then the whole question of inclusion comes in. If we're really serious about including everyone how then do we deal with this particular problem especially given the context of the oppression of Dalits in India uh, and low caste people in India. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's a really, really important point to make, Devlina. Um, so let, let's shift gears a little bit now and, and look at something very specific. And uh, Melanie has an image from the collection of the Archive of New South Wales, which I believe has been shared with you in some, some uh, digital manner. Um, an image of the Hindu gods Rama and Sita. Um, and I was wondering, Melanie, if you could say a few words about that. Yes, I hope people can see the image. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we can't I, see the image, so we're, we're presuming no, we can. I, you know, I've got one, but I hope other people do. So um, I was asked to select an image from the collection that might be appropriate for Diwali. And just as we were talking about with the sparklers and things with Devlina, we didn't have that image. What we did have was the image of uh, Rama and Sita enthroned after they had returned uh, from their 14 years in exile. So it's got Sita and Rama on the, the beautiful golden throne with the parasol above them, um, Lakshmana bes beside them and uh, Hanuman at Rama's feet. And so it's that moment after the exile, after Ravana had uh, captured Sita and then she had been uh, rescued by Rama and Lakshmana and Hanuman and brought back to 
the city where they've now um, become part of their community again. And I chose this one because it leads to one of the many Diwali stories, but about that, that festival of light and the excitement uh, about their return and celebrating with having lanterns and flowers and all of those things in the street. So a, a sort of different, a sort of slightly post Diwali moment. But the reason I also wanted to share this one is a very beautiful image from Jaipur in Rajasthan in the 1800s. And so it's very pretty and gorgeous, but also because uh, one of the things that I find fantastic about the Ramayana story is that this is not the end, uh, or it's not one of the only endings. So, so there's this kind of happy moment where everything's kind of come together. But then following that, um, Rama is concerned that perhaps Sita hasn't been true to him after all when she was um, in, captured by Ravana and sends her to live in the forest she's pregnant with twins and so that sort of starts to change her story and so I really love that this is a beautiful image but it shows that incredible detail and complexity of that story that works in so many different levels and is applied and used and enjoyed in different countries and in different ways so that the sort of Khmer interpretation the Thai interpretation is again different and so that is why I have chosen what it looks otherwise just like a very beautiful, pretty image of Rama and Sita enthroned. Thanks, Melanie. Thanks for sharing this work from our collection. Um, Gauri, uh, back to you with a question about um, what, how do you see Indian art and culture? How can it or how can it continue uh, to play a pivotal role in what we term cultural diplomacy? Yes, that's a um, very interesting question. Um, I think cultural diplomacy, as we term it uh, in recent times, was something that was already envisioned by some of the um, nationalist leaders. Um, and I would like to start by saying um, the best uh, way that India has um, and has successfully and can continue to successfully uh, explore out through its um, uh, cultural diplomacy is um, spirituality and uh, uh, Ayurveda, among many other things, of course. Um, um, and um, without going into the details of um, the human capital and the brain drain that is already happening, uh, I think the best example of uh, that was the recent um, American election results. But uh, focusing more on the cultural side, I think um, with um, you know uh, leaders are. Uh, cultural and religious leaders such as um, um, Swami Vivekananda in 1893, he went to the Parliament of Religions and then uh, in 1897, the first uh, Vedanta Society was set up in the US and with uh, Yogoda Satsang Society in uh, the early 20th century. A number of uh, uh, ways in which the spiritual uh, messages of uh, Indian philosophy have been sent out and are being continuously uh, propagated and promoted. Another very interesting idea that needs to be uh, further uh, pushed, and I am uh, aware that Indian government now has a Ayush ministry, which is also looking into the natural uh, healing processes and healing methodologies, which is another very important way uh, cultural diplomacy can um, uh, take a front seat. Uh, moving more closer to our area, we are the, the museum professionals and the people in the arts field, the visual and performing arts field. And I think not uh, neglecting popular culture, as I have uh, mentioned earlier, um, uh, in the uh, manner in which the diversity works, we also have uh, to uh, understand the formal, the governmental approach, and the non-formal mm -hmm. or informal and the non-governmental approach in the spread of uh, culture. And uh, I would say classical music, uh, film music is another very important area in which uh, culture can play a very important role of uh, shared heritage and um, building bridges and bringing people closer. Uh, art is another area, uh, you mentioned that in your opening remark about the traditional arts being more um, a museum or governmental uh, kind of an avenue, uh, whereas temporary art has its own um, uh, informal um, trajectory. And I think th these are two areas in which, of course, a lot of work has been done by 
uh, Australia, UK, US, um, and, and in Singapore, in our small way, we have tried at the Asian Civilizations Museum and now currently with the Indian Heritage Center of bringing more art uh, and reaching it to the masses. So I would say um, make it more accessible. And I think the, the, as we go towards uh, the power of social media and telecommunications, we need to make art more accessible and uh, understandable and palatable to a large audience uh, and moving beyond the fixation of cinema and cinema music, which is already yeah. in the whole world, um, blown away the whole world. Yeah, no, well put. Uh, thanks, Gary. Um, Raman, uh, back to you. And, and looking at that same issue, but from a slightly different perspective, how do you see the, um, you know, exporting cultural heritage um, can either um, facilitate or even sometimes hinder international relations, I think, you know, between nations? Uh, well, when, when it comes to the facilitation of relation, I feel uh, from India's perspective, uh, culture has always been a great facilitator uh, of uh, their developmental relation as of in the uh, previous intervention when I mentioned it, the diversity as attraction. That has not only uh, helped, but has uh, as remained as a catalyst while developing uh, any uh, outreach, global outreach for India, be it in the form of uh, Bollywood, be it in the form of culinary, be it in the form of uh, classical dances or even sculptures. So this has always been a facilitator for India uh, while uh, furthering various relations with uh, various countries as well as global institutions of eminence, and that has uh, strengthened uh, India's global outreach uh, worldwide. And when it comes to the uh, uh, festivities, as everybody is aware that India is a land of festivals, and uh, my previous speaker also mentioned that every month you will find there's a good amount of uh, festivals uh, various time because of its diverse nature. So uh, when the diaspora also transcended across the border, they also carried uh, their uh, traditions and customs while also constructively contributing to this uh, society. Uh, they also try to emulate uh, or not only emulate, I would say uh, they try to uh, practice whatever the heritage they carried with you or the legacy they carried uh, with you, which, which has evolved from thousands of years and generations to generations. As India is also has a rich tradition of passing on certain values uh, uh, skill sets from generation to generation. So certain diaspora also carried that uh, and created a, 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 a space for themselves in the global uh, canvas. When it comes to the uh, canvas, I would say that this, uh, this is the uh, transcendence of Indian culture worldwide. But uh, I doubt that uh, whether it has worked in a very conversely manner, I doubt about that because when it comes to the informal nature or the kind of warmth we enjoy in terms of festivities or cultural um, uh, interaction or engagements, uh, it has always been uh, uh, the facilitator or the uh, catalyst for developing relations worldwide. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. That's... Um... It's been a very, very, I think from the Australian perspective, it's been a very, very positive um, connection with Indian culture uh, that has, yeah, had, had a big impact on Australian society. Um, I think, Devlina, back to you. Um, just in, in a more sort of general sense, how, how relevant do you think, if we could call it traditional culture, um, is in today's um, globalized world? Does it sort of perhaps hold us back in some way? Does it help us move forward? And perhaps even just touch on how, you know, that promotion of traditional culture might also tie in with nationalism, certain elements of nationalism. Yes, look, I mean, in, in India, I think in particular, and I would suspect in most cultures is that there is no separation between the tradition and the modern. I mean, that, that's a mm -hmm. continuous process and elements of the tradition live in the modern and, and mm -hmm. the tradition was, uh, and the traditional cultures were also modern and and as Bruno Latour has said we have never been modern too I mean you know those both of those things um, seem to work um, to give you an example recently in Bengal we've had one of our biggest festival Durga Puja which is an image of the goddess um, with her sons uh, and daughters and she's killing a demon 
Um, and she has been represented variously as a migrant worker in, uh, with COVID. It was a terrible sort of toll taken on migrant workers who lost work in the cities. Uh, she has been represented as, as a sort of woman killing the COVID demon. So the, uh, the demon is actually the COVID. Uh, so, you know, there's been ways in which the, the, the various uh, image makers who are often um, not particularly you know, tertiary educated and often come from rural cultures who you would, might think might be very traditional, but they've been able to adopt, uh, adapt the festival into the modern. And I think yeah. that's kind of a really interesting because all of these kinds of religious religions and myths and beliefs are under, they underpin a deeper truth. And the deeper yeah. truth for the, the for today was the the kind of the the COVID problem, the the uh, oppression of, of poor people. All of those things then become part of that traditional modernity. They come into modernity as part of that that sort of tradition. Um, so the, the thing is that besides the fact that we have never been modern, the other part of it is that we have also never been pure. There is no pure tradition or pure mm -hmm. religion or pure belief to hark back to. Just the Ramayana, for example, from where the, the North Indian tradition of Dipavali comes from, which is lighting the lamps because Ramayana's, you know, Sita and Hanuman are coming back to Ayodhya. Uh, there are versions of Ramayana written all over the world, including there's a version written by a woman from Bangladesh, which is a really written in the in the 15th or 16th century, which is a very different version of the Ramayana because it centers Sita. Uh, there are versions written in South India by Kamban, which is again a different version where Ravan is presented very differently, the demon king. Versions written all over Southeast Asia, which have different inter interpretations of the Ramayana. So there is no, I mean, to me, there is no pure version of these. These, these festivals become what people make of them. And I think that's a part of the whole thing about nationalism is that if there is a nationalistic fervor in the country, then the festivals become exclusive. They exclude people because those who are not part of the nation, they get excluded from the celebration. When there is a better kind of nationalism or better kind of, of, of social fervor, they include people. Yeah. So yeah. I think our thing would have to be, I mean, for both diasporic communities and for India in particular, is not to discard traditions because it gives people a sense of centering of stability and those kinds of things, but to make them as open and inclusive as possible. And to remember that these traditions have massively changed over the centuries. There is no pure tradition. And that's healthy. That's a good thing. Yeah. I think that that's a really terrific message for art museums in general, I think, where we we aim to to share our cultural heritage by by making it inclusive and giving you know, a broader community of people the opportunity to to share in those different cultures, whether different aspects of their own culture or aspects of of other cultures. Uh, a very fantastic message. Now, I, I had a couple of uh, questions for Melanie and Gary, but really, I think you've you've um, you've sort of answered um, some of that in your previous beautiful answers. So I might just before we go to questions from the audience. I might just have a, a final question for Ramanand, and that is about how the role, the potential role of the Indian diaspora in, in uh, Indian cultural diplomacy around the world. Yes, uh, they are, the, uh, the diaspora, Indian diaspora has uh, time and again and rather consistently they have played a very important role in cultural diplomacy of India. As I mentioned previously, that they not only uh, just go for their uh, development or whatever their uh, professional engagements, but the certain amount of value set also they carry. And that not only uh, helps them individually, but also uh, with the periphery around uh, them and uh, help them in a very positive manner. So that has always been a very uh, positive uh, diaspora, has always been as a catalyst in their developing uh, relations. And when it comes to the rich uh, and diverse uh, uh, diaspora present in various parts of the world, uh, like Australia, Europe, or US for that matter, there is like sixth generation, fifth generation diaspora is now uh, present. There has always been a uh, 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 great, uh, promoter of Indian culture, uh, rather uh, in terms of when Honorable Prime Minister and Narendra Modi mentions, he mentioned uh, he called themselves as a cultural ambassadors of India. So uh, when they make an outreach uh, individually or in a society, they carried uh, the culture uh, in a great detail, 
when it comes to their attire, in terms of their linguistic ability, when it comes to their uh, educational capabilities, when it comes to the their uh, value set, all these uh, has formed a very niche for itself and has always been, been of great help uh, for that. And uh, not only it's uh, for the diaspora, which is in the generations, but as the diaspora also matures, they have also strived hard to pass on those value sets, skill set, which they have inherited uh, from their elders in the past and uh, pass it on to the uh, next generation in the form of various uh, informal engagements or such kind of festivals like Diwali, Dashera, or various other uh, festivals or Makar Sankranti or Lori for that matter, which also has a significance in terms of uh, nature, in terms of uh, social engagements and social uh, harmony. So they also strive hard to uh, uh, strengthen their roots for next generation also, as, as, uh, simultaneously also uh, encourage them to be this, uh, socially active as well as a very constructive role for themselves. And in, uh, I feel that made a, a, a prominent footprint for Indian culture on a global scale. As uh, also when it comes to the diaspora, their food habits, their um, uh, uh, means their traditional clothing has also created that uh, space for themselves. Like the sari women for uh, for saris, and then uh, traditional kurta pajamas for men, or even dhoti for that matter. All. So this has created a various uh, significance. And when it comes to the uh, diverse nature. Uh, it has become a space for us in uh, for Indian culture in a uh, global level. Yeah, and on that point, Ramanan, I, I would like to acknowledge the the Indian community in Australia for being uh, for working so uh, so wonderfully well to 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 preserve and promote their inherited culture from India, but also to be part of a very genuinely multicultural Australia. Now, it's really all your turn now to um, ask the panel some questions. I've got a couple here up on the chat function. I've got a very big question here um, about, you know, as India and China as two giant sort of rising powers um, and, and how they uh, approach soft power and cultural diplomacy very differently. I'm wondering if, Gary, if you'd like to have um, a first go at that since Singapore, of course, has a very significant Indian community and Chinese community, um, you know, how, how you experience those, those differences in uh, in soft power and cultural diplomacy in Singapore? Okay, I'll <laughs> the first stab at it. Um, looking at sheer numbers, uh, of course, China wins hands down. Um, in terms of uh, engagement with Chinese heritage. Uh, in Singapore, we also have currently a Chinese heritage center built by uh, the PRC government in uh, Singapore, and they have many activities uh, by which they promote Indian uh, Chinese culture. S something similar we don't have in uh, Singapore from the Indian government. However, the ICCR, the Indian uh, Council of Cultural Relations, has been having many shows and sending many groups of artists uh, and also there is a um, tie-up with the Indian Heritage Center, which uh, organizes many uh, crafts, demonstrations, and exhibitions. Um, a lot more can be done in that area. Uh, with regards to um, exhibitions uh, that are being held uh, by the Asian Civilizations Museum, with which I was associated for more than 17 years, uh, starting from the mid-1990s, I definitely see the cultural cooperation uh, between China and Singapore much more active and many significant exhibitions have been held uh, and, uh, and continue to be uh, negotiated uh, by our uh, teams in the uh, Asian Civilizations Museum. So I would say definitely soft power and cultural diplomacy of um, uh, China is definitely uh, having a a lot of uh, heart share and mind share and India can do much more. Yeah. Melanie, I wonder if you might like to comment on that too, since you had, uh, from your, your perspective, working in an Australian art museum as our senior creator of Asian art in general and having worked yourself in India, uh, Cambodia, um, how, how do you see it working in terms of um, 
the ease of, of working, say, with, with Indian or Chinese soft diplomacy, cultural diplomacy? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, each sort of government takes very different approaches, as, as we know. Um, I suppose from the Indian perspective, I've had some really exceptionally positive experiences. Um, particularly, we had a, a time a few years ago where uh, the Art Gallery of New South Wales and the National Gallery of Australia returned some sculptures to India and we worked very closely with um, the, High, the High Commission and other Indian government organisations here as well as with the Australian government to arrange that return and it was an official return that was uh, that took place between then Prime Minister Tony Abbott and uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi so it's quite um, an official sort of event uh, and I was the courier for that and it was a very powerful experience but what was incredible was after that, rather than um, not building the relationships, that actually in, in impressed upon a, a more powerful relationship culturally um, between Australia and India in one way. And one, one of those ways was that we took uh, the National Gallery of Australia, an exhibition from the National Museum in Delhi that was curated by Dr. Vijay Mato, who was then the uh, head of painting. And it was an exhibition of Ramayana paintings telling the story from the beginning to the end um, through 101 paintings, but um, not in a chronological, not the painting styles were from different periods, but the story was kind of in order. And, and it did talk about that there were different ways of telling those stories. And it built a very nice and ongoing relationship um, through a very generous, gesture, uh, which also allowed Australians to see these extraordinary paintings that we don't often get to see. And um, that the, the impacts of those are so, those sorts of things are so powerful, but they're often intangible and it's hard to measure them. Yeah, I think it's also worth just remembering that in a country like Australia, we tend not to have such strong collections in our art museums of historical art from Asia. So we redo really rely much more on exchanges of art as opposed to what we accumulated during colonial and uh, imperial times. Um, a, a quick question for, I think it have to be to you Ramanand, I'm afraid, but um, about um, how has COVID affected, impacted on in, uh, India's image in the world? Perhaps a, a brief answer to that. Uh, Yes, the COVID has always been the challenge. I would say is a, go, a global challenge. It has also affected India, mm -hmm. um, and there was uh, critical situations also. But then, when it comes to the uh, social structure of India, that has uh, helped Indian uh, community, uh, Indian within India as well as abroad, uh, to deal with this uh, very uh, major challenge. Uh, in terms of like uh, when I may, I would like to mention some of the uh, community structures, community organizations within India has helped uh, various uh, various social uh, so society members in terms of their need, like those who are the people uh, in terms of um, informal nature of work, I would say. Uh, to help them uh, financially, to help them uh, for in terms of then the government also uh, into working in tandem with uh, state government has helped various uh, aspects of society. Uh, for the artists, I would say Indian Council for Cultural Relations and then various, even the prominent artists came up together, uh, has created uh, various uh, virtual events, uh, ticketed events, I would say, or instrument makers. So this is how they have uh, evolved across these kinds of uh, various initiatives as physical interaction was restrained due to COVID pandemic and uh, leads to certain uh, ch challenging uh, eventualities for life. But uh, this uh, strong nature of community uh, has helped uh, people to overcome it and they're effectively dealing with it even though it has not uh, vanished in, from India as I guess until and unless the vaccination is in place, it will be very difficult to deal with. But yeah. uh, you can't remain uh, shut down throughout as uh, uh, the uh, demographic uh, is India's is also diverse. So to deal with that kind of diverse nature, the uh, diverse uh, measures was also in, uh, incorporated in place. And in that, uh, the society, uh, all elements of society uh, came forward 
contributed their bit and also worked in tandem with the government and help each other in whatever possibility uh, available to, uh, and resources at their disposal and uh, deal with this challenge very effective manner yeah, and yeah. in that oh, so, uh, the uh, uh, festivals also they have uh, restrained themselves here like the uh, ganesh festival which is celebrated in india in a very large scale but it was celebrated or the uh, very famous pilgrimage of alandi in maharashtra it was not done this is the tradition of uh, hundreds of years where 7 to 8 lakh people gathered with uninvited uh, since these many years but this year the collective call was taken that not to gather and uh, this is how responsible uh, behavior was shown. Yeah, no, th thank you very much, and congratulations on on, on those successes. Look, uh, given that we're we're probably running a bit short of time, I'm going to skip over the question about the um, you know, soft power being used to counter some negative um, um, images of India. I think that's a that's a universal issue, um, and I think. So let's, uh, I'll, I'll take that as sort of answered in a way that, it, of course, it can, but it's not a particularly Indian issue. Um, I think a really interesting question that perhaps I might direct to you, Devlina, is um, India is home to a fifth of the world's youth. What can be said about modern Indian culture and art? You know, and, and there's a comparison, say, with Korea and, and K-pop. Uh, I mean, the obvious answer is there's, there's Bollywood, but, but Bollywood, I think, is not necessarily a, a youth oh, culture. No. I was wondering if you see any emerging trends that, that yeah. might sort of knock K-pop off its perch. Yeah. Um, look, I think that would be like actually saying something like, how can European culture, the whole of Europe, be transmitted to the world through one particular medium? Yeah. I mean, India's a subcontinent. I mean, the mm. cultures are massively diverse. Um, like Europe, I mean, there are, there's a majority religion, Hinduism, that uh, in a lot of people have in common. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, languages, uh, cuisines, cultures, uh, customs are very, very different. And each region has its strength, I mean, as, as in terms of what is presented. A lot of this actually has to do with what is easily uh, transmitted. So Bollywood, Bhangra, these have been the easily transmitted uh, parts of Indian culture, just like Punjabi, North Indian food. But now, of course, you have a situation where you have much more South Indian food. There's a kind of more, uh, say, Bengali or Maharashtra differences. I actually think that we need to move on from thinking of India being represented yeah. by one thing mm -hmm. and move on to look at India being represented by multiple different kinds of cultural artifacts or traditions or movements. And so rather than yeah. thinking, oh, this is the way India can be represented through Bollywood. And Bollywood is, is very popular. I mean, I like it. It's not, I've got nothing against it, mm -hmm. but it's only one part of yeah. 1.2 million people. Um, and and for example, Bollywood is, is not what's, uh, what's really sort of uh, popular in Japan. Japan, apparently, Rajini Khan from South India is an absolute hero. And because he speaks to a certain something about Japanese you know, culture or film. So I think if we move away from that, we would have a much better chance of understanding yeah. the diversity of Indian cultures rather than expecting something like K-pop to be, you know, yeah. some yeah. one thing. Um, uh, in a much more, relatively much more homogeneous yeah. you know, country and culture. I think in a way that's, that's what art museums are finding is to, you know, to do an exhibition on you know, Indian art or the, you know, the treasures of Indian art. It just isn't possible. I'm not sure the audience really wants that. I think the audience is, is much more interested in finding, you know, meeting an individual Indian artist or, or a more localized tradition, you know, different perspectives. Now you mentioned a, a version of the Ramayana written by a woman. I mean, that's, I think people are interested in that just as much as some very, very huge notion. Uh, we are very almost at the end of time, but I think um, there's a final question about how, gal how art galleries are remaining relevant in the digital era, and particularly when a lot of museums are closed down. I'm pleased to say the Art Gallery of New South Wales has been fortunate enough to have reopened uh, on June the 1st, having closed down for just 10 weeks. I know it's been much tougher for our colleagues in Melbourne at the NGV. But um, I wonder if we could just perhaps end up with a final question for you, Gary, about Singapore, and if you can have a thought about that, but also just you know, how, how are things going in Singapore in terms of your museums in, in, the, in the pandemic? Yes, uh, so the pandemic situation uh, has been quite um, debilitating for the museum and the art, uh, visual arts industry in general. Uh, 
our museums have opened since um, I think October. Uh, and uh, of course the footfall is uh, very, very uh, limited. Uh, we also see a number of youth uh, visitors uh, over say the senior citizens who were um, who, who are more careful. And so many of our programs are directed on the digital platforms and whether the National Gallery of uh, Singapore uh, or the Asian Civilizations Museum or the um, Indian Heritage Center and the other heritage centers uh, are um, uh, encouraged. So the National Heritage Board is encouraging uh, various uh, institutions uh, to come up with digital programming. They're also giving them some uh, seed funding to, to go on digital platform if they are not like the Museum Roundtable members. Uh, but all our major museums have um, uh, very creatively adapted to the digital platform and reaching out to people of different age groups, starting from children to senior citizens uh, and taking art and culture in a very uh, slow and uh, at a pace where they can enjoy it. Um, there's also a lot of emphasis on education, and there are a lot of, uh, as all other museums in the world are also doing, uh, there are several uh, lecture series being organized by our museums. They're in involving the docent community as well to talk about the collection. So from not being able to physically visit the museums, I think uh, in one word or in a summary a form, I can say that the focus has gone back to the collections. Yeah. And uh, that has uh, really opened up a wealth of uh, potential and opportunities for museums to engage their audiences. Yeah, no, thank you. That, that's, I think that's exactly what we're finding in Australia too, and my colleagues in, in Europe and North America. That, that's a very healthy thing. Um, but also I think, I think these new digital technologies will certainly improve our ability to change, exchange ideas more quickly and efficiently with colleagues in India itself where you know, logistical issues can perhaps make exhibitions uh, you know, more difficult. But I, I need to hand back now, I think, to Philip. I'd like to thank my fellow uh, panelists for your uh, fantastic uh, thoughts and insights into this uh, really big issue. Um, and now um, back to you, Philip, but thank you very much. Well, thanks so much, Michael, and thank you very much to all our speakers. Uh, it was a really rich uh, discussion and I really appreciate, and on behalf of Asia Society, I appreciate your time and insights. Um, thank you, of course, to all our viewers and listeners for joining us. And thanks again to the Art Gallery of New South Wales uh, and the Visa Asia Council for partnering with us on this program and just being our friend and partner in Sydney. Um, next week, we are going to East Asia. Um, and on the 17th of November, we're going to discuss the legacy of Confucianism across Asia and how it's evolved in, uh, in the region. So we'll explore how faith, religion, and belief system shape communities, particularly in East Asia, uh, and how it's reflected in the art that are uh, produced in the region. So if you're interested in this discussion, please join us next week on the 17th of November. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, for moderating and hosting us virtually, but soon hopefully we'll do it in person. And again, thanks so much to our speakers and listeners. Thank, Thank you, Philip. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.